where it is kind of just gets in the way. And so many times we try to do something and it's never enough. But during that time of waiting, we are hungry for more. We are hungry for more energy and perfection. The tribes we have depended on their own strength and on your many warriors. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion. Therefore, I will wait for him. So be it. Yes? No? Yes. Okay, now you can hear me. So before I pray, I was thinking of that song, Love Lifted Me, and everything in that fishing trip. I'll have to tell you, if you guys have never fished for sturgeon, you go out with a joy set before you of catching that sturgeon. And along the way, you're like, how much more pain and suffering am I going to endure <laughs> trying to get that big fish out of those currents and up to that shore? It's... So many times I wanted to throw that rod and reel overboard, say it was done with, this hurts too bad, I can't go on. But you saw the picture of the joy of both of us when we got it back there. It wasn't long at all when Francine was handing that rod off to me because she said, I'm done. But I said to myself and to everyone else, I was done after a few minutes and after over an hour longer, we finally got that big boy to the shore. I say that not to brag or, or anything else or not to change the subject, but to point to a, a sermon illustration. We are called to be fishers of men. No matter how much, no matter how hard, we keep on going until we bring them home. Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you as we go into your word, Lord. Help us to think of all the, the things that the Spirit is telling us, Lord, and not to be just hearers of the word, but doers only. And Lord, we do thank you and praise you that it is because of you and who you are, your mercy, your grace, your love, your justice, and everything else that I could go on and on. And all because of Jesus Christ, who covers our sin-stained hearts totally, who satisfies the wrath that you have for us because of our sin and stiff-necked rebellion. And Father, we continue to sin, but we're covered by grace. Lord, help us to realize this great salvation that we have, to work it out with fear and trembling, to realize that we have been called to be fishers of men, that we're called to even step out of the boat if that's necessary and walk on water as long as we fix our eyes on Jesus. Because you've left us here on this earth to be fishers of men. We just thank you and praise you for your amazing, abundant grace that, that is new and refreshing every day that will satisfy and fill us all the way till we spend eternity with you. We thank you and praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen. So this past week's reading that you should have read, and if you haven't figured that out by now, if you haven't read it, you don't necessarily know everything I'm talking about because I'm going to be expounding upon what we've read this week. You finished reading 2 Kings 17 through 25. So you, kept, you finished reading the history of the kings and kingdoms of Israel and the, wor and the world. You also started re reading Hosea. I will call Hosea this, an amazing love story. How's that? Does that help you figure that one out? And you're going to finish it up today or tomorrow. I'm not sure which. And then you read a few more chapters in Matthew. You read Matthew chapter 5, uh, 15 through 19. So I'm going to start in 2 Kings chapter 17, verse 1. In the twelfth year of Ahaz, king of Judah, and that, remember that's the southern kingdom because the kingdoms have already split, Hoshea, son of Elah, became king of Israel in Samaria, the northern kingdom, and he reigned nine years. This is the story of kings and kingdoms. But it's not the story of kingdom, kings and kingdoms. It is history. It is his story it is God's story written through man because he is in control of all things and he works things for good to those who love him, all things. 
If you don't, uh, let me read verse 2. He did evil in the sight of the Lord's, but not like the kings of Israel who preceded him. We've had this story of back and forth of good and evil and whether people would follow the Lord and the kings are out there to guide the people. We don't need kings, but we called for a king like the pagan countries. And these kings are out to be a representative of God and to proclaim justice and peace and teach the people to obey the laws and festivals and so forth. And this king is named Hosea. Does that sound familiar? It's from the family line of Joshua. It means salvation. If you remember back... In Numbers chapter 13, verses 16 and 17, these are the names of the men Moses sent to explore the land. Moses gave Hosea, son of Nun, the name Joshua. He changed his name from salvation to Jehovah is salvation. Because if you don't realize that, you're going to try to save yourselves by your own means. You're going to think it's by your own power and own might. You're going to follow your will instead of God's will. And you're certainly not going to see how scriptures point to Jesus Christ and that he is the reason for our very being, the breath that we have. And we are called to be his hands and feet in this world until we go home. That he has called us to become fishers of men. Not by our own mights, but because he will make us fishers of men. Oh, probably 15 minutes into fighting that fish. I was going to say a half hour at first, but that would be lying. <laughs> probably 15 minutes into fighting that fish, I'm like, I have no strength left. I cannot do this. This is too hard, too painful. You know, I could just drop this rod over the side of the boat. And nobody would know. But I continued on by the grace of God. And when, when we did catch him and go through the enjoyment of that, I went to the front of the boat and Sherry said, what are you doing? She said, you're thanking God, aren't you? I said, yes. Yes, I am, for so many things, but not so much the catch, but that we were able to make it through to the catch, okay? Because so many times you feel that way in ministry, in this life, whatever things are facing you, and we're called to fish for people all along the way, and we caught that fish also in the very last minute of the day when you thought it was all over with, so I can think of more sermon illustrations, but we'll save them for another day. If we keep reading in 2 Kings chapter 17, verse 3, Shalmanasar, king of Assyria, came up to attack Hosea, who had been Shamanar's vessel. He had paid him tribute. We pay our allegiance, we pay tribute for one king or one kingdom or the other. And I'll remind you that Jesus said you're either with him and gathering or you're against him and you're scattering. But the king of Assyria discovered that Hosea was a traitor. Oh, how many times have I been a traitor to my God? For he had sent envoys to the king of Egypt because I put my faith in other kings and kingdoms in my well-being and so forth. And I don't go out fishing for men. I go do the things that I want to do. I think it's about my life and my power and my life. So he sent envoys. Uh, so the king of Egypt, he no longer paid tribute to the king of Assyria. He had done this year by year. Therefore Shalmanasar seized him and put him in prison. The king of Assyria invaded the entire land, marched against Samaria, and laid seed to it for three years. In the ninth year of Hosea, the king of Assyria captured Samaria and deported the Israelites to Assyria. He settled them in Halah and Gozan on the Habor River in the town of the Medes. No more northern kingdom. No more Israel. We started out with a kingdom that God had given them a king, but Saul turned his eyes and his heart on himself. So God sought out a new king, one that would follow after him, that would desire him, that would serve him. And we know that David was not a sinless man by any means. But when he sinned and realized it, he realized that he sinned against God and he asked for his forgiveness and he meant it. But from that point on, the kings and kingdoms went back and forth from good from evil. And if you look and examine them, there were more evil kings than there were good kings. The kingdom divided, and now we have the fall of the northern kingdom. Obadiah had warned the kingdoms of Israel. Joel warned them. Elijah warned them. Elisha warned them. Jonah warned them. Amos warned them. Hosea warned them. And time and time again, we were stiff-necked. We went back to our gods, to the things that we kept in our heart rather than God in our heart, rather than loving and serving the Lord our God with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our strength. Is this not what you would call adultery if you were in a marriage? And you were warned over and over and over again by these counselors 
by these prophets from God that you needed to turn and repent and come back to your first love. Oh yeah, Jesus has to tell that to the churches even after he's left this earth, doesn't he? So here we are in chapter 17. The northern kingdom is gone. Verse 7 of 2 Kings 17. All this took place because the Israelites had sinned against the Lord their God who had brought them out of Egypt from under the power power of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. They worshiped other gods and they followed the practices of the nations the Lord had driven out before them, as well as the practices of the ki- that the kings of Israel had introduced. God said he would take the people into the promised land, but that generation besides Joshua and Caleb did not see the promised land. They followed in their rebellion, but thank goodness God is faithful. He brought their children into the promised land, the land that he did for them, for cities they did not build, vineyards they did not plant, and so forth. But they did not drive out the pagan idols from the land, and they held on to the pagan idols that they had from Israel, longingly looking back. And then the judges that they came along, we haven't read much of that yet, and then the kings came along, and it says here that the practices that the kings of Israel had introduced led them even further from the Lord rather than closer to the Lord. Verse 9, the Israelites secretly did things against the Lord their God that were not right. From watchtower to fortified city, they built themselves high places in all their towns. They set up sacred stones and Asherah poles on every high hill under every spreading tree. At every high place, they burned incense as the nations whom the Lord had driven out before them had done. They did wicked things that aroused the Lord's anger. They worshipped idols, though the Lord had said, You shall not do this. Verse 13, The Lord warned Israel and Judah through all his prophets and seers. Turn from your evil ways. Observe my commands and decrees in accordance with the entire law that I commanded your ancestors to obey and that I deliver to you through my servants and prophets. As you read that, you should have thought back to everything that we read in Leviticus and in Numbers and when the children of ours and grandchildren of ours came to us and asked us why we did this. We told them about God, His holiness, His justice, His love, His mercy, His grace, and that's why we did what we did because we were His people. Now you know the name of Jesus Christ. You know what He's done for you. Are you living that way and are you teaching your children? Verse 14, But they would not listen and were stiff-necked as their ancestors who did not trust in the Lord their God. They rejected His decrees and the covenant He made with their ancestors and the statues He had warned them to keep. They followed worthless idols and them they themselves became worthless. They imitated the nations around them, although the Lord had ordered them, do not do as they do. They forsook all the commands of the Lord their God and made for themselves two idols cast in the shape of calves and an Asherah pole. They bowed down to all the starry hosts and they worshipped Baal. Do you look different than the world around you who does not proclaim Jesus Christ? Are you a light to this world? Are you salt to this world? Do they see your good deeds and glorify your Father which is in heaven? Are you known by the love that you have for one another? Verse 17, they sacrificed their sons and daughters in the fire. You might not do that literally, but are you doing that figuratively? Are you doing that with their souls by not raising them up and teaching them the Lord's decrees talking about them when you sit down, when you get up, when you go about, or are you worried about other things along the way where it takes away from you doing that? They practiced divination and sought omens and sold themselves to do evil things in the eyes of the Lord, arousing His anger. So the Lord was very angry with Israel, and He removed them from His presence. Only the tribe of Judah was left, and even Judah did not keep the commands of their Lord, for they followed the practices that Israel had introduced to them. We'll take you back for a little bit, and I'll just try to read this and not expound on it. Deuteronomy chapter 6. These are the commands, decrees, and laws the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess, so that you, your children, and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all His decrees and commands that I give you, so that you may enjoy long life. 
Hear, Israel, and be careful to obey, so that it may go well with you, and that you may increase greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, promised you. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. When the Lord your God brings you into the land, he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you a land with large, flourishing city, cities that you did not build, houses filled with all kinds of good things that you did not provide, wells that you did not dig, and vineyards and olive groves that you did not plant. Then when you eat and are satisfied, be careful that you do not forget the Lord who brought you out of Egypt, out of a land of slavery. Fear the Lord your God, serve him only, and take your oaths in his name. Do not follow other gods, the gods of the people around you, for the Lord your God who is among you is a jealous God, and his anger will burn against you, and he will destroy you from the face of the land. Do not put the Lord your God to the test as you did at Massah. Be sure to keep the commands of the Lord your God and the stipulations and decrees that he has given you. Do what is right and good in the Lord's sight so that it may go well with you and you may go in and take over the good land the Lord promised on oath to your ancestors, thrusting out all your enemies before you. As the Lord said in the future, when your sons ask, what is the meaning of the stipulations, decrees, and laws the Lord our God has commanded you? You tell, the, tell him, we were slaves of Pharaoh in Egypt, but the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. Before our eyes, the Lord sent signs and wonders, great and tr terrible, on Egypt and Pharaoh and his whole household. But he brought us up from there to bring us in and give us the land he promised on oath to our ancestors. The Lord commanded us to obey all these decrees and to fear the Lord our God so that we might always prosper and be kept alive, as in the case today. And if we're careful to obey all this law before the Lord our God, as he has commanded us, that will be our righteousness. Praise God for Jesus Christ, because we fail time and time and time and time again. But you have been bought with a price. You have been justified. You have been sanctified. You are God's. You are covered in the righteousness and robes of Jesus Christ if you believe and put your faith and trust in Him. But be careful that you do not be tossed around in the waves, that you fix your eyes firmly on Jesus, that you continue in the things that the Lord has taught you. What hypocrisy must have been in their hearts? What hypocrisy is in my heart? I don't do this. There are times when I do this better than other times, but there are many times when I lose focus and look at the people in the land, look at the idols in the land, and don't do this. It matters what you do in this world. And you can't do it in secret as we read earlier. Everything will be exposed and shouted from the rooftops. And it matters to my children and my grandchildren and their children. Boy, how I need to follow after these words. How are you living then in the land that the Lord God has given you? I look back at the previous sermon titles that I had written down. And, I, and the one was, I am bound for the promised land. Then the next one was building your life. Then rising to the top last week. And I entitled this, what did I entitle it? <laughs> what? So what comes next? Sorry, I didn't write that down. So what comes next? Do you stay in your hypocrisy? Do you turn? Do you, do you listen to the warnings that have been out there? Are you doing great? If so, like, do you focus your eyes on Jesus and continue where you're at? There were good letters and bad letters written to the seven churches. I have to consider the kings and kingdoms of this world what times and situations that we're living in and whose allegiance am I pledging and whose kingdom am I, am I advancing by whom I serve? Is it King Jesus or not? So then I took a little bit of time to jot down some modern day idols for myself and for you. Our identity. Who are you known as? Are you known as a businessman? Are you known as a Christian? If you're known for a Christian, what ministries and things are you known for? Because you're not just known for a Christian if you're not doing things. 
Oh, he's a Christian because he proclaims to be one. Oh, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. What is your identity? What do you strive for, work for? What about our children and grandchildren? They're a blessing and heritage of the Lord, but do you love them more than the Lord? Do you spend more time pleasing them and doing things with them or more time teaching about Jesus? How about ourselves? What are you not willing to give up for God? How many things do you do to please yourself rather than to please God? What do you work for? What do you spend your money and your time on? Oh, that brings me to money, doesn't it? Yeah, you've got to work for it. You've got to have it to buy things. But what kind of things are you purchasing? Are you purchasing the things that will make you happy? Or the things that will provide, as the king should have done there, for justice and mercy and grace and equality and to spread the gospel message? Does your money bring you security? Or do you consider yourself to be rich, because you are, again, in this country, so that you can be rich to others? How about our jobs and career? Do you work the best that you can for the job that you can to be a light? Or do you work for things? Or do you go in and grumble and complain and say, boy, I wish I didn't have this job. That's a good attitude, isn't it? You really show your light then, won't you? Do you realize that your workplace is probably the best place that you can be planting seeds and there is a harvest coming? Health and appearance. What if you lost either one? As you grow older, you realize that you're not going to keep them if you ever had them. But what if you lost them? What if you couldn't go on? Would you still thank God for the life that you have and still try to be a witness for the breath that you had in your body today, whether the, your body functioned well or not? How about in entertainment and socialization? Okay. How much time do you spend watching TV or spend on the computer or phone or even visiting people? It's a great thing to go out and visit people. But are you spreading the gospel message? Are you doing good deeds? Or are you just socializing? There's a big difference between socialization and fellowship. <laughs> between going out and doing ministry. How are you living your life? Are you living your life for a place of comfort, complacency, or laziness? Or, since I got this illustration to use, are you fighting that fish and fighting that fish when you don't have enough energy that's left? And you say, why in the world, Fred, see, did you talk me into doing this? <laughs> but when you see the smile on their face at the end of the day and know that you have accomplished it, and I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength, let me put it right back to my Savior and my King and my Lord. And that's just one day where we fish for fish. And on the way back, I think the thing that we talked about the most was how we could fish for men as a result of that. You have one life to live, and you will be, a, be held accountable for it. And the last things that...
chap, the, the book of Keys ends this way. Chapter 25, verse 27. On the 27th day of the 12th month of the 37th year of the exile of Judas King Jehoiakim, in the, in the year evil, evil Merodica, I don't know how to pronounce it, close enough, became king of Babylon, he released King Jehoiakim of Judah from prison. Why? And he spoke kindly to Jehoiakim and set his throne above the throne of other kings who were with him in Babylon. Babylon has conquered the world, the kings and kingdoms of the world. But he finds favor on this king of Israel who didn't get to reign in Israel, that would have got to reign in Israel if they would only follow the decrees of the Lord. Verse 29, so Jehoiakim changed out his prison clothes and dined regularly at the king's table for the rest of his life. And the king provided Jehoiakim a daily portion for the rest of his life. What about you? You've been invited to the Lord's table to spend all eternity. Do you have the right clothes on? And are you going about inviting other people to the great feast? If you've been set free by Jesus, you're free indeed to serve him or not to serve him. The choice is up to you. 2 Corinthians 6, verses 1 and 2, As God's co-workers, then we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. For he says, In the time of my favor I heard you, in the day of salvation I helped you. I tell you, now is the time of God's favor, now is the day of salvation. Peter wrote, 1 Peter 1, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect, exiles scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with his blood, grace and peace be yours in abundance. Praise be to you, to the praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. The inheritance is kept in heaven for you who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. Skip down to verse 13. Therefore, with minds that are alert and full, fully sober, set your hopes on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed in his coming. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who calls you is holy, so be holy in all that you do. For it is written, Be holy because I am holy. Since you call on the Father who judges each work, each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. Let's keep reading to Peter for a few minutes. First Peter chapter 2, verse 1, then. Therefore, rid yourselves of malice and all deceit and hypocrisy, envy, slander of every kind. Like newborn babies crave spiritual milk, so that it may grow you up in your salvation. Now that you have tasted the Lord is good, as you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Verse 11, dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from the sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day we visit. Are you living that way? Well, let's look at Hosea for a minute. Hmm. Hosea was a prophet to the northern kingdom of Israel during those days, but he wasn't really listened to, was he? Hosea is also the name Hosea, the same as the king. It means salvation. He knew that Jehovah was salvation, and he spread that gospel message to the world, but they failed to listen to him, and the northern kingdom <coughs> fell and went off into captivity. Will you listen to your Lord and Savior? Hosea chapter 1, verse 1, Then the word of the Lord came to Hosea, son of Barry, during the reign of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, and during the reign of Jeroboam, son of Jehoash, king of Israel. When the Lord began to speak to Hosea, the Lord said to him, Go marry a promiscuous woman and have children with her. 
For like an adulterous wife, this land is guilty of unfaithfulness to the Lord. So he married Gomer, daughter of Diblam, and she conceived and bore him a son. This story, this message, this word of truth to us, the world would not understand. Why would God ever tell you to marry a woman who has already been promiscuous? Will she ever be faithful? Can she be faithful? Isn't that who we are? Because we were dead in our trespasses and sin when God called us. But he called us out of the darkness into the light. But see, other people don't want to come out of the darkness because they know the light will expose their deeds. Isn't that what Jesus said to Nicodemus? Because you should understand this. And not only marry her, but have children with her. Children that you need to raise up and everything that are born to a prostitute. You're, what you do in this world matters. And it matters to your children and your children's children, doesn't it? And this story tells the same. King James Version says it this way. Go take unto thee a wife of whoredom and children of whoredom. For the land hath committed great whoredom departing from the Lord. Gomer means complete. What will you do with your life? Because one day it will be complete. And you will be called to account for everything that you've done. Even every thought. Everything you did in secrecy. So when your life is complete, what are you going to say about the life and the example that you've shown to your children? Starting in verse 3 again. So he married Gomer, daughter of Dibbon, and she conceived and bore him a son. Then the Lord said to Hosea, Call him Jezreel, because I will soon punish the house. The house, that means family. That your sins matter upon your children. I will punish the house of Jehu for the massacre of Jezreel and will put an end to the kingdom of Israel. This kingdom that you think that you have, that you put your faith and your trust in. That you say, I have done all these things by my, my might. Verse 5, And that day I will break Israel's bow in the valley of Jezreel. Gomer conceived again and gave birth to a daughter. Then the Lord said to Hosea, Call her lo Ruhamah, which means not love, for I will no longer show love to Israel, but that I should at all forgive them. Yet I will show love to Judah. I will save them, not by bow, sword, or battle, or by horsemen or, uh, horses or horsemen, but I, the Lord their God, will save them. And as you read, read and will read some more, you will understand how God saved them. After she weaned Lo Ramah, Gomer had another son. Then the Lord called him Lo Ami, which means not my people, for you are not my people, and I am not your God. Wouldn't it make a lot more sense to proclaim Jesus with your mouth, to love him with all of your heart? And then to follow him by denying yourself, taking up your cross and following after Jesus. The names of your children might be totally different. Now I name mine Jacob, which is deceiver, but it is also changed to Israel. So I, I look at that now as I think he's more in the foreign land. And I pray and pray and pray to God that he will call him and that he will answer him. Verse 10 of Hosea 1. Oh, and if you hadn't got it yet, Hosea is a picture of Jesus, right? Yet the Israelites will be like the sands on the seashore, which cannot be measured or counted. In the place where it has, has said to them, You are not my people, they will be scattered children of the living God. Praise be to God for his amazing love, his faithfulness, his mercy, his grace. Hosea 2, verse 2. Rebuke your mother, rebuke her. For she is not my wife, and I'm not her husband. Let her remove the adulterous look in her face and the unfaithfulness from between her breasts. Hosea was told to go marry a promiscuous woman. I'll use that instead of the other word. It doesn't sound as good. But hey, Jesus called us to save us, to come into a covenant relationship with him. The church is called the bride. Are we living that way? Are we living a promiscuous wife? Bringing children into boredom. 
Hosea 3, verse 1, The Lord said to me, Go show your love to your wife again. Though she is loved by another man and is adulterous, love her as the Lord loves the Israelites. Though they turn to other gods and love the sacred raisin cake, so I brought her, bought her for 15 shekels of silver and about a homer and a length of, a lethic, lethic of barley. Then I told her, You are to live with me many days. You must not be a prostitute or be intimate with any man. And I will behave the same towards you. Jesus is faithful. <laughs> he loved you to the very end. Went silent to the cross and laid down his life. No one took it from him so that you could live. Hosea chapter 4 verse 1. Hear the Lord, you Israelites, because the Lord has a charge to bring against you who live in the land. There is no faithfulness, no love, no acknowledgement of God in the land. Verse 6, my people are destroyed from their lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I also reject you as my priest. Because you have ignored the laws of your God, I will ignore your children. Hosea chapter 5, verse 4, their deeds do not permit them to return to their God. A spirit of prostitution is in their heart. They do not acknowledge the Lord. Verse 13, one of the children of Israel, when Ephraim saw his sickness and Judah his sores, then Ephraim turned to Assyria and sent to the great king for help. But he is not able to cure them, not able to heal your sores. Jacob's children turned to other gods. Hosea 6, chapter 1, or chapter 6, verse 1. Come, let us return to the Lord. He has torn us to pieces, but he will heal us. He has injured us, but he will bind up our wounds. Chapter 7, verse 2. But they did not, do not realize that I remember all their evil deeds. Their sin engulfed them. They are always before me. Chapter 8, verse 13. Though they sacrifice as gifts to me, and though they eat the meat, the Lord is not pleased with them. That now he will remember their wickedness and punish their sins. They will return to Egypt. Israel has forgotten their maker and built palaces. Judah has fortified many towns. But I will send fire on their cities that will consume their fortresses. You sit in the United States and you think everything is good and you have all this freedom, but are you using this freedom wisely to proclaim Jesus Christ? Hosea chapter 9, verse 16, Ephraim is blighted, their root is withered, they yield no fruit. Are you producing fruit? Even if they bear children, I will slay their cherished offspring. I'll ask you again for the sake of your children. Are you bearing fruit? Hosea chapter 10 verse 3. They will say, We have no king because we do not revere the Lord. But even if we had a king, what could he do for us? My sermon title. So what comes next? Do you say you've not been unfaithful at all? Do you say it's my life? I live my life the way it is? Or are you going to repent and turn to God? And don't tell me there's not anything to repent from either. Ask God to examine your hearts. And then let Him expose you in your nakedness to see the truth. God is so faithful and He will heal you if you turn to Him. So we read through Hosea chapter 11. I'll read you verses 1 and 4. When Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt I called my son. But the more they were called, the more they went away from me. They sacrificed to the Baals and they burned incense to images. It was I who taught Ephraim to walk, taking them by the arms. But they did not realize it was I who healed them. I led them with cords of human kindness, with ties of love. To them I was like, the, like one who lifts a child to the cheek. And I bent down to feed them. Verse 8. How can I give you up, Ephraim? How can I hand you over, Israel? How can I treat you like Adma? How can I make you like Zebahim? My heart is changed within me. All my compassion is aroused. I will not carry out my fierce anger, nor will I devastate Ephraim again. For I am a God and not a man, the Holy One among you. I will not come against their cities. They will follow the Lord. He will roar like a lion. When he roars, his children will come trembling from the west. You've heard the roar of the lion of Judah. He did it when he laid down his life to save you. Have you come to him? Have you wandered off the path and you need to hear his words and come back again? 
fall back into your first love. Because if you're just lukewarm, Jesus is going to come take what you think you have from you. Yes, I'm talking about the letters to the church of Ephesus and Laodicea. But they're words to us. Are you comprehending this message of God through Hosea? Because the kings and kingdoms of Israel did not comprehend it. They did not listen. They stayed unfaithful in their whoredom. No matter how faithful, how loving, how kind God was to them. Will you reaffirm your marriage vows if you haven't made them yet? Will you raise your children up to do the same? Will you raise children out of prostitution and raise them in the heavenly realms? Jesus continues his teaching to his disciples in Matthew chapter 15 to 19. And in chapter 19, you happen to ironically, I say that ironically, read about divorce and little children coming to Jesus, didn't you? Because we look at things with physical eyes rather than spiritual eyes. We want to sit there and talk about divorce and think about the bodily ramifications, the things here on earth. But marriage was given so that we could see a relationship with God. Adam was left alone in a sinless state to know that he was, it was not good for him to be alone. And God created Eve, his mate, to be with him, his helpmate, to be there for him. God instituted marriage so that we could see how great that was supposed to be, to see how great a relationship restored with God would be once we sin. Children were a blessing and a heritage from God before sin ever came into this world because he doesn't want the family units destroyed. He wants them to be passed down from generation to generation to generation so that the <coughs> families will come to him. So in Matthew chapter 19, verse 3, some Pharisees came to him to test him. They asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? They were looking for something to justify themselves. Jesus said, haven't you read that in the beginning the Creator made them male and female and said, for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two but one flesh. Therefore what God has joined together let no one separate. Why then, that, then they asked, did Moses command that a man give his wife a certificate of divorce and send her away? Jesus replied, Moses permitted you to divorce your wife because your hearts were hard. But it was not this way from the beginning. I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. Can you apply this to Hosea? Can you apply this to Jesus Christ and his love to you and the marriage covenant that you have made to him to be faithful? To follow after him, walking by his side and doing the things that he did on this earth until he comes back. And claims you as his very own. A few verses down, Jesus said, Let the little children come to me, because they were trying to be hindered. Do not hinder them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. All you need is that childlike faith. When you did pick him up in your arms, and that child just reached apart and loved you. As soon as I sat down this morning in the chair, waiting on the rest of the kids to get ready, here comes Bella to get in my lap. You think I'm going to turn her away? No way. Next thing I did was like, ah, Papa's not feeling good. <laughs> so wonderful, the love that they give, the trust that they have for you. And they are listening to you and they are watching you plant seeds that God will harvest. Verse 21, Jesus said to the crowd, this is after they, they've wondered how in the world can anyone be saved. He said, if you want to be perfect, go sell all your possessions, give to the poor, and you will have treasures in heaven. Then come and follow me. It's not about that you've got to sell everything to follow Jesus. It's about not holding on to anything that will keep you from following Jesus. You can be rich and give richly. Or you can sit there and look at the things of this world and keep them as your gods, your idols, even though you don't want to admit that, and hold on to them and trust in them whether there are any of the things that I mentioned or something that I did not mention, rather than fixing your eyes on Jesus and not worrying about anything, it's better for you to cut off your hand if it causes you to sin or gouge out your eye, isn't it? Did Gomer ever quit in her adultery and become faithful to her husband, Hosea? The scripture doesn't tell us. We don't know. But I say that for a very good reason. 
That is a question presented to you today. Will you be faithful? You know the truth. You sit here, here week to week. You study it. You read God's Word. But does it go in one ear and out the other, or does it impact your heart and your lives? The Word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. It cuts in and it cuts out and it exposes the desires of your heart so that you know what your desires are and you can lay them down at the feet of Jesus or you can continue to live for them. The choice is up to you. But what you do matters. So here's the question that I started the sermon with. What comes next? Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you for the amazing love of Jesus Christ that he would met and come and call us out of our sinful promiscuity to live a different life, to leave this world behind so that we can be fishers of men, not only to strangers and our enemies, but especially to the children and the heritage that you have given us. Oh God, I pray especially for the children of each and every one in here and the grandchildren of each and every one and those even not born yet. Lord, help us to live lives based on that, where we, out of holy fear, condemn the world and build an ark, no matter how long it takes, so that our children and our children's children will enter in. We thank you for the ark, which is Jesus Christ. There is no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. Help us to follow after our King and our Lord and bask in the victory that is His. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.